Uh, this is what you're looking at is uh, Admiral Woodward's 1992 book, 100 Days, The Memoirs of the Falkrum's Battle Group Commander, with a foreword by the Right Honorable Margaret Thatcher. <coughs> Um, it's 1992, the Falklands War was in 1982. If you're not aware, there was a war between Argentina and the United Kingdom in uh, 1982 uh, in the spring. Most of the actual combat was in May 1982. The, um, it's a nonfiction book. And we'll come back to that. My real topic, though, is about uh, how people with expertise in one domain inappropriately apply their knowledge and experience to another. Uh, I'm going to just talk about it in publishing, although I may make a series because there's so many of these. You. It's inapt sometimes to apply what you know, even if you're well experienced in one area, to another. Now, the um, <clears throat> uh, begins his book talking about uh, the sinking of the Sheffield. And there's an image of the destroyer, the Sheffield. And this had a lot of meaning to Admiral Woodward. He had, on his way up to becoming Admiral and Commander of the Battle Group, he had once been the commanding officer of the destroyer Sheffield. Uh, it was sunk by an Exocet missile fired by Argentina. This was two days after the British had sunk the General Belgrano. <clears throat> and, you know, the actual fighting war begins, May 1. There is a Sea Harrier. Uh, chapter 8, there's 18 chapters. <clears throat> Belgrano listing before it sinks. This is uh, probably, if you're reading this or viewing this, you're younger and don't remember this, but this was quite a big deal. Uh, Admiral Woodward sent a signal to a submarine, that, the Conqueror, that was near the Belgrano. The signal read, from CTG, Commander Task Force, Task group to conqueror. Text priority flash. Attack Belgrano group. It's that simple, but uh, in response, I'm abbreviating the story. Uh, conqueror launched a uh, old but effective torpedoes that struck the Belgrano and uh, Sanker was a cruiser, big cruiser, over 300 uh, Argentinian uh, sailors died, although more than 700 uh, survived, uh, although many were not rescued for 30 hours in the high seas. Now, war started, fighting war started May 1, May 2nd. We sink the Belgrano, May 4th, the Argentinians sink the United Kingdom destroyer Sheffield. This is a fascinating book about extraordinarily important matters, war, where people kill, are killed. <clears throat> uh, much less important, my book 
is about a single murder, single death. Uh, there's the killer, convicted, upheld on appeal, a brutal murder. There's the victim, his ex-wife. That's pretty common in true crime books. If you don't know, uh, true crime books are not considered with respect except by people in the true crime book business. This is considered with respect. I mean, major book about a war, the guy who basically won the war and <clears throat> the actual combat. Uh, and this is about, uh, I actually interview the, the main detectives and, uh, you know, it's largely about their work. Um, I'm certain these books have different editors. Um, the editor of True Crime Books and the supervisor of editors of True Crime Books are not likely to be the same people who would be editors and editor supervisors for a book like this. Now then, <clears throat> books much better known uh, would have completely different editors. This is fiction. This is a children's book. Um, and this is fiction. Nancy Drew. The Clue of the Tapping Heels. Now, this was originally published in 1939. This was a later adaptation. I don't know. I did read the 1939 version. Uh, I don't think this is the same illustration that was in the 1939 version, but it's probably pretty close if it's not. Uh, and you see what's happening here? She's all tied, that's Nancy Drew, all tied up. Nancy Drew. And she seems to be tapping her heels. The story is almost embarrassing. Nancy Drew manages to summon help because she has taught herself how to tap dance in Morse code. She, uh, <laughs> that's it. That's the story. She's kidnapped in the 1939 version by two black men who are going to return to her uh, for some nefarious purposes. But she manages to summon help by her tap dancing heels. Uh, it's almost as child story ridiculous as this one about a boy wizard on a flying broomstick. But they both uh, sold a lot of books and, uh, um, you know, influenced many, many people. Uh, each of the um, chapters here have uh, illustrations and illustrations have something to do with what's happening in that chapter. So it's just like uh, just like this book. So the illustrations beginning each chapter has something to do with the content of that chapter. <clears throat> when I'd reached the editing process of this, I had asked about the possibility of uh, including a few illustrations. Uh, because my experience was not with having illustrations in fiction, but in nonfiction. In fact, this is one book, before my move, I had a whole stack 
of nonfiction books with illustrations in them, just like this book. But in the move, those are all stored away in storage in another town. So I just have this one available to me right now. Anyway, so my editor had her supervising editor talk to me. And she was appalled that I would even ask. She was very scornful. She said, you mean my children's books? Turns out, uh, even though she had been an editor a long time, she had worked in arenas like true crime. She did not have experience with books for adults and had, was aware of, <clears throat> you know, children's books, Nancy Drew and Harry Potter. And uh, I said, well, I'll pay for the illustrations. And no, they would not permit it in a true crime book. Now, uh, I, I do not criticize the true crime book genre. I mean, I'm published in it. Um, but um, by, this was a big five publisher. And uh, the people that worked there at that time, this was published in, well, the, it says 2009. It was actually in late 2008. This book was on the bookshelves. I bought copies at Borders Books. I gave them to friends. Um, The editor, the supervising editor, obviously did not know about these uh, far more important books. They're written for a different audience. Uh, I, I've been reluctant to talk about what the, they told me about the true crime book audience. There's a bell curve, and the vast majority of people in the middle of that bell curve, they have no more than a high school education. That's who reads true crime books. They know how to read, and they read this. Five out of six are women, and um, that's who buys these books. <laughs> that's what I was told. Now this, like I said, 2008, 2009, uh, this was completed in early 2008, uh, published uh, you know, before the end of the year. It takes a while. Uh, traditional publishing. Now, it's a completely different world with self-publishing. Uh, for short books, you can write uh, one today and, pub you know, get it in the pipeline to be published today. <coughs> uh, depending on various factors, it's probably available for purchase in a couple of weeks. At most a uh, couple months, if you're talking about an actual physical copy of a book. So that particular editor had a lot of experience, but they were in really the lower markets, uh, like true crime, and not the upper nonfiction markets. I don't have any problem. I mean, they, it's just market division. I you know I worked in antitrust law, and there's market divisions and actually sell a lot more of this than of either of these. Probably Nancy Drew here has sold a lot more than uh, either of these. Yeah, I bet so. Point is, she, this uh, supervising editor knew a lot about her domain and applied it inappropriately to other domains as if you wouldn't have illustrations um, <laughs> and they, they do it's very common that this book's published in 92 uh, I had uh, it's been common to have illustrations in nonfiction books and I suspect with self-publishers that will become even more frequent 